Hey everyone, so in this video I'm going to talk about J.J. Thompson's famous CRT experiment. So as you've probably already figured out by now, this gentleman here on the left side of your screen is J.J. Thompson. And this image here on the right side of your screen is a CRT. So what is a CRT? Well CRT stands for cathode ray tube. And in a nutshell, it's basically just a glass tube that has had much of the air vacuumed out of it and it has an electrode on either side. Now, even though it's not shown in this image, in order for the cathode ray tube to work, these electrodes have to be connected to a high voltage voltage source. And these electrodes have names. The electrode from which the cathode rays originate, this is called the cathode. Oops, cathode. And the other electrode that serves to complete the circuit, this is the anode. So when this high voltage source is applied across this partially evacuated glass tube, you will see cathode rays flow from the cathode to the anode. So it was around the, uh, the mid uh, 19th century that scientists were really, you know, was, were, were hardcore studying these uh, CRTs. And, um, you know, a lot of them were just probing the effects of them. You know, what are they? How do they behave? What are their properties? And so forth. So one of the things, one of the reasons why cathode rays were so popular among scientists and even among the general public at the time was because they looked really cool. Um, just imagine it's, you know, 1855, you're sitting in your house, you know, you're reading papers by candlelight, you don't even have electricity in your house yet, and then along comes some scientist and he's got this tube with these electrodes attached to it and he turns this thing on and it's glowing and it looks really exciting. I mean, he, that, that was really impressive at the time, and in my opinion, it still looks cool even today. So the fact that cathode rays were cool looking and, and visually appealing uh, definitely helped along you know, the science that led to uh, the discovery of the, elect the electron, which is ultimately where, uh, where these experiments culminated. So some of the early ideas about uh, cathode rays, there were a lot of conflicting ideas about what these cathode rays were. Uh, a lot of scientists thought that they were actually waves that were traveling in a uh, hypothetical fluid, which they called the ether. And other scientists uh, were convinced that these, uh, these were actually material particles and that they weren't uh, waves. So there were a lot of conflicting ideas. And one of the things that puzzled many scientists uh, was that they were, they were uh, influenced by a magnetic field but they were not apparently influenced by an electric field. So if you had a cathode ray tube and you held a strong magnet up to it, you can actually see the cathode rays sort of bend a little bit. But this didn't happen when you put, uh, when you, so that happened when you put a magnet up to it, but when you put electrically charged plates up to it, it didn't seem to be affected by an electric field. So there was kind of a, a, a problem there because the, the scientists, they thought that these, the, these particles may have had a charge to them or these waves or particles or whatever they were, uh, thought that the cathode rays had a charge to them, but if they had a charge to them, then they should have been influenced by an electric field, and they weren't. So they, it was kind of a it was kind of a mystery. So Thompson, you know, was one of the many scientists that were studying these things, and he and he uh, he speculated a couple of things. First, he was he was one of the scientists that was convinced uh, that they were material particles and not waves. And he actually took it further than that. He said that, okay, not only are they material particles, but they're smaller than the atom, and they are actually building blocks of the atom. So uh, before I go any further, um, I'd like to just, you know, recognize right here and now that the discovery of the electron um, was not, uh, it, it was a highly collaborative effort. It cannot be attributed to just one man. So Thompson may be the most important guy uh, he might be the you know the biggest fish in the pond, but he's certainly not the only guy. There were uh, many other contributors, um, Heinrich Hertz, for instance, uh, his student Philip Lennard, um, Jean Perrin over in France, Emil Weichert, um, and 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 many many others, uh, many other very you know brilliant, very gifted scientists contributed to this. Contributed to this, and Thompson pretty much just drew upon their work, and he he uh, you know he 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 took all the information from all these different papers and built a superior apparatus and was able to take it uh, to the next level. So uh, talking about, let's talk about Thompson's actual experiments here. Um, he, what he, he, what he observed were uh, a couple of things about cathode rays. First, he observed that they traveled in straight lines. 
So this was significant because this suggested his, uh, his speculation uh, that they were particles. If, if they were waves, then you probably would have seen some kind of interference pattern or something characteristic of waves, but they didn't do that. They traveled in straight lines. So that supported the idea that they were particles. Uh, also, they were independent of the material from which they originated. So in other words, it didn't matter what metal, what glass tube you used. It didn't matter uh, what electrodes you used. It could have been a zinc electrode. It could have been a copper electrode. Whatever electrode you used, it didn't matter. The, uh, the cathode rays still had the same properties. So this, this piece of information actually suggested that, uh, that they were indeed building blocks of atoms. And uh, he also observed that they carried a negative charge. So, and the reason why this is significant is because uh, atoms are neutral. So if there's, if, there's a, if there's a particle that carries an elect uh, a negative electrical charge, then that means that it must be a building block of an atom. So he, he also observed uh, furthermore that, uh, that the cathode rays bent when you expose them to an electric or a magnetic field. So a, a moment ago, I was talking about how, you know, when earlier experiments, they sort of failed to bend the cathode ray with an electric field. The reason why this is, is because they're, uh, the vacuum pumps that they used to evacuate the tube were not sophisticated enough. Uh, Thompson's, like I said before, Thompson's apparatus was superior in that he was actually able to take nearly all of the air out of the tube. And when there was a lot of air remaining in the tube, the gas particles actually acted as a conductive material. So that when you turn on that electric field, the rays didn't bend because there was already an electric conduct electrical conductor in place with those gas particles. But once enough of them were removed, then the cathode rays were actually, you know, influenced by the electric field in the absence of that conductor. So they were electrically charged and they were uh, influenced by magnetic fields as well. So by measuring the extent to which the cathode rays were deflected uh, by a certain electric field strength or magnetic field strength, I'm not really going to get into the specifics of the calculations, but I will provide a link to it um, in the description box. Uh, Thompson was able to calculate the charge to mass ratio of these guys, so of, of these cathode rays. And the value that he got for the charge to mass ratio of the cathode rays turned out to be negative 1.76 times 10 to the 8 coulombs per gram. And this is a very, very large negative number, which actually implied that the... Uh, that the mass of these, ca these individual cathode ray particles was about 2,000 times lighter than a hydrogen, uh, a hydrogen atom, which is the lightest known uh, atom and still is today. So these results were pretty incredible. Um, not, only, not only do you have uh, something sm smaller than an atom, but you have something a lot smaller than an atom and it is negatively charged. So in the aftermath of these experiments, uh, that led uh, Thompson to formulate a couple of hypotheses. Um, first of all, he, he hypothesized that these uh, that these cathode rays were actually particles, which he called corpuscles. He didn't call them electrons. The term electron would actually be coined later on by some other dude. I can't remember his name. Uh, and he actually took it a step further, and he, um, he concluded that these corpuscles were actually units. They, they were parts of atoms. And uh, he actually took it even further than that, and he, he speculated that, uh, he hypothesized, rather, uh, that these corpuscles were the only building blocks of atoms, which, of course, now we know to be untrue. Now we know that there uh, are many other subatomic particles that exist besides um, electrons. But, uh, and of course, these hypotheses were met with, you know, criticism. There was a lot of controversy associated with them. Um, you know, the first two were, were fairly, you know, were, were largely correct, at least, you know, by today's standards. But the third one, obviously, we know that to be untrue. And uh, there were some remaining questions just lingering around. I mean, now that we know that electrons exist uh, and we know that atoms are positively charged, or excuse me, we know that atoms are electrically neutral, well, how does, where does the positive charge come from? How does the positive charge fit into all of this? You know, there must be some positive charge canceling out that negative charge that we have in electrons. So how does that fit in? Is it, are, are they particles? Are they, you know, waves? How does, what, what is the, um, what are the properties of the positive charge? And from this, um, Thompson was able to uh, suggest a model of the atom, which he called the plum pudding model. 
And basically under this model, you have a sphere of positive charge in which uh, many um, electrons are embedded. So this um, plum pudding model is what, uh, is what J.J. Thompson uh, hypothesized. And as we will see in a, uh, a video uh, very, very soon, he actually, be, he actually turned out to be incorrect. And it was his own student that actually proved him wrong. So I'm going to leave it there. And uh, in the next video, I'll talk about the charge of the electron and uh, another uh, very important experiment to determine the uh, atomic structure. So, uh, all right, have a good day.